Okay. So we're live on YouTube. Good morning, everyone. This is the fifth series of the webinar uh, series on uh, the ELSL uh, Environmental Landscape Studio and lab Laboratories. No? And our, top, our topic for today is large-scale developments, uh, uh, specifically on resorts and land manipulation. So our speaker for today is uh, the Managing Director of Land Design One, or uh, we call it LD1, no? And he graduated uh, in UP, BLA, in 1995. And during his uh, student year, second year pa lang siya, he was recruited to uh, work in IP Santos, no? And from 1990. Uh, 1992, I think, to 1999, nagtrabaho siya kay IP Santos. And when he graduated in 1995, he took the board exam in 1996 and nagtap siya. So, uh, board top notcher tong speaker natin, no? In fact, uh, they, uh, he was one of the, what do you call that? He was one of the uh, directors of SGS Designs, no? Nagtinayo nila yung SGS Designs in 19... Uh, 98, I think, and most of the members of SGS Designs are all board top notchers. Tama ba ako, sir? Mm, well, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 99, anyway, SGS 99. Yeah, okay, sige. And uh, he is a member of PALA since 1996 and SILA or the Singapore uh, Institute of Landscape Architects uh, in 2001, okay. Uh, in bit, okay. In 2011, uh, together with some colleagues, no, uh, they put up Land Design One in Singapore, and in 2013, uh, they put up the uh, LD One office in the Philippines. No, he was uh, he handled projects mostly on mixed use, uh, commercial projects, uh, a lot of hotels and resorts, resorts did uh, golf and country club here in the Philippines. Uh, and uh, the, uh, recently, they have community planning uh, in Singapore. Most projects in Singapore are in community planning and urban design. Okay, so I present to you uh, the Managing Director of LD1, uh, Landscape Architect, Neil Samak. Good morning. Good morning, Vic. Thank you, Sharon and students. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, thank you for that lengthy uh, introduction. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, thank you for inviting me to speak, uh, students. Uh, I think... Uh, I could not. I could not say no to Vic because I remember our conversation before. One of our conversations before that, uh, we mentioned that uh, we have a lot of um, uh, alumni uh, from the UP uh, BLA program all over the world uh, who are practicing in different aspects of uh, of the profession, and they would be a good uh, resource for those who are up and coming. Um, I am not really fond of doing public speaking, but since, uh, yeah, that conversation, then uh, here we are. So are we going to start? Do we start now? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, let Lars is yours. Okay. Um, what I'll be sharing today, wait, hang on, let me share my screen. Okay, uh, is it visible, Vic? Yes. There you go. So what I'll be sharing today is uh, on large scale development and, uh, with focus on resorts and uh, land manipulation. Um, 
<clears throat> mostly it's on the development and then uh, three land manipulation by definition uh, i will not go lengthy into it but uh, through the case studies we can see how this is done uh, i think because i think in, in any project uh, as a landscape architect you know, when you start working with a site you are always doing some form of land manipulation how you do it whether by grading or by building is you know um, de depends on, on on the design so let me start off um i will uh <clears throat> this is the outline of of my discussion today um i'll go uh, define project scales as i understand it so you can see um uh here I, I define three types, you know, with, with projects, small caps, and projects with a capital, and then you have projects in all caps. I will explain that later. Then I will go on to a case study, uh, uh, the Marina Bay Sands, one of the uh, high profile projects in Singapore that I was fortunate to work on. And then um, through uh, other projects also, I will show, uh, uh, part of the design process, how we uh, <clears throat> how how projects uh, arrive uh, or or how projects look the way they are through the design that we do. Um, so let me start off project scales. So there are three types of projects I mentioned earlier. So how do I define um, projects in small caps? These are small to medium scale projects. Uh, the scale is, uh, in terms of area, is small, and the investment is, uh, you can't say it's small, but modest, right? And then there are limited stakeholders. When I say stakeholders, this can be um, the owners. Uh, you can be dealing with a, a family. You can be dealing with a small company, small developer, and uh, or, or an individual who likes to develop his land, right? And so uh, there is a shorter uh, development in terms of design and construction. The, the period is short, any anywhere from say a year, two years, uh, the most free to, to build these uh, developments. Um, in terms of complication, not, uh, I'll show you later, it's very straightforward. Uh, not much, uh, 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 what do you call this? Uh, um, complications in the design, right, um, and, and the build. You know, <clears throat> no no need for new uh, uh, techniques or technology. You can use what is existing. So the public profile can also be low. It, it could be, you know, uh, it, it's it's under the radar even. These can these pro these types of projects can be done by uh, single practitioners or uh, small scale practices, uh, anywhere from uh, one person. Uh, uh, practice to to say five. So some samples of that. Um, this is a house, uh, a residence that we did in Singapore. Um, uh, as you can see, in terms of scale, it is very small. But uh, obviously, the owner is uh, affluent or rich. Um, he, he spent most of uh, the land on, on his house itself, redeveloped it, and uh, put a bit into the landscape. So this is about, the whole lot is about 650 square meters, right? Um, <clears throat> and you can uh, maybe uh, at least 30% of that is into the landscape and his white driveway. So he, he has a bit of uh, stone finishes. So let's say this, this one will, uh, the investment is anywhere from 35 to 75,000. Uh, these are in US dollars. And, and <clears throat> I know in, 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 in the local context, this could still be uh, substantial for such a small place. But in the Singapore context, um, this is uh, uh, quite modest. Right. So, um, uh, this is a resort, in, in a family resort in Batangas. Um, it, like like the the stakeholder is the family. They approached uh, us and say and asked if we could look look at their land. We worked with the an architect, local architect, um, and uh, we did the planning for this one. 
the land is relatively flat, you know, facing the ocean and it's adjacent to an existing resort. So they're really, uh, the, the only complication here is that uh, there are existing trees, but uh, otherwise no special techniques need to be done. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, in practice, two to three person in practice could, could finish this. In fact, uh, most of this was uh, done by uh, myself, you know, on, on, mostly on my own during the design process. Um, in Singapore, uh, this is a, a small project. It's a redevelopment of an existing um, icon here in Singapore, but it's more on the redevelopment of the outdoor spaces. And the architect we worked with uh, worked on some indoor spaces. So as you can see, the, the land area is not, not very uh, big, but uh, we were asked to, uh, how do you say it? Um, look at it creatively and see how we can update the look uh, in, the, in, co in the context of the existing uh, features, right? So this is the Marina Barrage. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who has been here, um, the, the top of this structure is used for kite flying, um, picnics and all that. So what we did was the areas below, we developed the areas below, which, uh, uh, this one did not really have a, a, a huge budget. It's very modest. Again, in US dollars, this is less than five five million uh, US dollars. Uh, and uh, as you will see later, as as I show you the other um, type of projects, um, it, it's quite modest, right? So it, it's more refreshing the look. So we'll go on to uh, projects uh, with capital P. These are large scale projects or large medium scale, right? These are larger in scale in terms of size and investment, right? So, and usually done by established developers. Um, you can sometimes have uh, multiple stakeholders, uh, maybe a private public partnership uh, in some cases here in Singapore. And then you have uh, longer periods of uh, construction and development anywhere from three, four, five years, right? So um, it is still not as complicated, uh, maybe in terms of engineering, because we are here, we build on podiums, but uh, in our case, it is the norm. So uh, it, uh, for us, it, it's, it's like uh, um, using old technology and just uh, applying it. In terms of public profile, depending on the project, uh, it could be medium to high, right? And usually these types of projects can be managed by a small to large uh, practices, anywhere from five or 10 people and above can, can accomplish these types of projects. So this is a uh, condominium complex um, uh, uh, in Singapore um, with a resort theme, right? So <clears throat> it's a, built in a, uh, 35 square meter lot, uh, lot you know, 3.5 hectares. And the budget uh, for the whole uh, development uh, can run anywhere from 30 to 6 million US dollars, right? In, in the Philippine money, it's, uh, it's in the billions. Um, so if you look at the landscape, say you can say like 10% of that goes into the landscape. Uh, you still have six to 8 million. And since we have pools and, and a lot of uh, water elements, maybe a little more than that, right? So, sorry, this is uh, <clears throat> how it looks like from Google Earth, um, uh, the completed projects. You can see there are several pools, um, uh, several amenities also. And, and the complication of this project is that all of this is on a podium, right? So uh, underneath is a car park basement car park. So in the Philippines, large scale developments that we, uh, I was uh, <clears throat> able to be involved with, um, uh, Tagaytay Highlands. So this one is a sprawling development, um, uh, completed in 1994 uh, by IP Santos and Associates. So you have the clubhouse, you have, uh, uh, I believe an 18 hole golf course. 
um, 18 or 27, I can't remember. Um, and then uh, you have residential uh, subdivisions attached to it, high-end residential uh, uh, community development. Another one in the Philippines is Mount Malaray at Gulf and Country Club. It's also a large-scale development, not as large as uh, Tagaytay Highlands in terms of um, uh, lot size or uh, development size, but still 185 hectares is, is not something uh, you can turn a small. This one is the one with 27 golf courses, uh, 27 whole golf course. Um, you have a hotel, a spa, and sports facilities attached. Um, in the international uh, corner, we have um, the Shangri-La uh, Vilingili Resort. This is in the Maldives. Um, we did this in 2005. It was completed in um 2009 um so uh, the the public release uh, uh uh funding for this is at uh, 150 million dollars to develop the whole island right so so here it is as it stands today so <clears throat> and uh another a large scale project, the Intercontinental Huchu Resort. This is in the Guangdong province of China. Um, we started doing this sometime 2006 and they opened in 2009. I think uh, the time here is wrong. I think we also did this in 2005, then completed partially in phases 2009. So it is a hotel. Um, uh, don't mind the cap, uh, caption, uh, there's an error there. It is a hotel uh, complex with a spa connected. And then uh, this is in a, uh, actually there was a, a natural lake in the area that uh, was um, utilized as part of the scenery. So I can show you that a little bit more later. So this is it today. Uh, most of the planning, and the uh, areas that we designed were were built, not 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 necessarily <clears throat> not exactly the way it was uh, designed, but uh, built in 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 in, uh, in any case. So um, the last type of projects are mega projects, right? So by definition, um, mega projects are large scale, and then these are complex ventures, as you'll see later. And it gives uh, the definition gives a minimum of uh, of one billion dollar cost or more. So in, in some of the projects that I show you, yes, but it also states in the definition, which I did say here, is that in 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 uh, you have to look at it in context. For developing countries, for instance, anything that uh, uh, goes uh, uh, around the hundred five hundred million uh, mark is already a mega pro consider considered a mega project. But in other parts of the world, this is the, um, the, the thing they look at. In terms of, um, say, architecture or engineering, a mega project would be like uh, the Burj Khalifa in, in, um, in Dubai or, or uh, 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 the, uh, a dam complex in China. You know, these are, these are mega projects in that trade. In our case, uh, I'll show you later, <clears throat> they are more sprawling and, and uh, these, these types of projects, they uh, tend to have a very long, uh, 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 how do you say, construction life. It, it goes on in, in phases. So, um, the initial planning that you do uh, can still morph in a period of five or 10 years. These are the type of mega projects that uh, landscape architects uh, work with, right? So again, um, if you go by uh, character, it has multiple stakeholders, and here it's internal and external. Probably uh, more investors, uh, the the public sector, and then the developer itself, and others. Um, it can be huge in scale, uh, in size, um, or um, you know, uh, the land area 
does not necessarily have to be big, but like in structures building up as the highest tower is also is uh, considered, uh, can be considered as a mega project, right? The complication, uh, it is enhanced. Usually there are new, uh, new techniques. In, in the case of projects here in Singapore, um, uh, new engineering techniques uh, were, were actually invented for the project. Uh, or 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 um, uh, rethought out in order to to fit the project so that it works with the project. Um, it is composed of many parts and phases, like I mentioned earlier. Um, <clears throat> one project can be uh, are broken up into several uh, sub projects, and and each project is led by uh, not one group of. Uh, uh, one subgroup of the architectural team, one subgroup of the engineering team, and, and so on, right? So um, it has very high profile. Um, you can read it on the papers. Uh, and even after it's built, you know, you can hear about it. Um, which you will understand later. And where it was built, it will have a, uh, a social and economic effect, right? So um, in terms of uh, development, there is an expanded consultant team, right? So you have, uh, like for instance, us, we had to have consultants, sub, as landscape architects, we had to have sub consultants uh, like uh, attached to us on a daily basis, like an irrigation specialist, for instance, an arborist, uh, an expert in, in construction of uh, timber, for instance. Uh, it's it, because uh, of the scale, uh, uh, of that project, you know, and and the demand for uh, the quality of that project. So this one definitely you need to have a medium uh, to large practice, anywhere from uh, 20 and above, uh, 20 man team, 100 man team um, is is a must um, due to the project complication. What are the uh, samples of these? In the Philippines, you have the Philippine Arena. Um, one of the uh, latest mega projects there in Bulacan. Bonifacio Global City uh, is a mega project. Uh, it's still ongoing to this to this day. Uh, New Valley, Santa Rosa. Uh, and, and right now, uh, New Clark City is happening. So um, that will also take years to finish. Um, but uh, there are mini mega projects within it, like like the uh, the sports complex that was recently completed, uh, the um, the government offices that are being completed. So uh, these are the type of um, <clears throat> mega projects um, in the Philippines. So this is the Philippine Arena. Uh, it, it what's built now is the um, stadium, which is uh, the apparently the biggest in the world and can fit 55,000 people. So this was designed by a foreign architect and landscape architect, and uh, it sits inside a 140 hectare development. So uh, uh, this one is gonna go on for years. In uh, other parts of the complex will go on for years. So, <clears throat> and the budget for this is, uh, you know, huge. Um, if you think uh, it's, said um, it's published via 230 million. And if you look at, uh, say, take a certain percentage of that, uh, um, of that overall cost, you still have 15 to 20 million dollars in, in, in landscape construction budget. That is uh, it's big. Um, of course, I mentioned Bonifacio Global City. Everybody's been there. Um, New Valley. Is ongoing with many sub projects within the development. Uh, New Clark City. Um, there will be definitely sub -meg uh, mega projects within it, like I mentioned. And in inter international terms, <clears throat> these are projects, uh, two of them I'm very familiar with because I, I was fortunate enough to work on it. And of course, everybody's heard about the Jewel in Changi Airport. Um, so the Viva Bahria in, in Qatar is, uh, is a city 
reclaim, literally a reclaimed uh, city in, in uh, part of Qatar, uh, in the city of Doha. So we only worked on a small spot, which is still huge uh, in, in a part of that, that uh, development. As you can see, the whole, uh, the whole reclaimed area um, is a city on its own. Um, the one encircled where he worked on it are 23 uh, residential towers that is connected by a um, boardwalk that goes out into a beach, as you can see below. So this whole development, uh, the, the published uh, uh, funding for it is anywhere from 15 to $20 billion. And that is uh, huge and it's still ongoing up to this point. Of course, the Marina Bay Sands um, is one of the most high profile projects in the region uh, during the time it was uh, uh, from, from the start of the uh, uh, design competition until the time it was built. So that's a period of probably uh, about four years, probably anywhere from five, six years. So I can show you more of this later. And of course, the jewel is uh, is now an architectural icon all over the world, right? And, and anybody, everybody wants to see it, how it was done. My uh, <clears throat> my uh, connection to this, or almost connection to this, was it was the same design team that uh, uh, did the Marina Bay Sands. It's Safety Architects and Peter Walker Partners, and. Uh, during the um, during the tender stage for the contractors, I was invited by one of the the uh, French contractor team to consult on how uh, we can acclimate trees because all these trees have been brought in uh, under the dome. So that was my almost connection to it. Uh, we that that <clears throat> somebody else won, but it was uh, it was an experience just the same. So um, case studies for uh, Marina Bay Sands. So one of the questions posed to me by Vic is that what happens in large scale projects, right? So I, I went for the largest I could think of that I, I was involved in uh, for uh, you know, a period of my career. So when you do projects like this and you're, you're, you're um, Given the responsibility to lead it, it becomes uh, as a as a practitioner, as a professional in an office, it becomes your life. You can't do anything else. It's your everyday life. So I did this uh, for, for three years, almost three or four years, um, since the time I was uh, given the responsibility to, to lead it. So what are the stages in in projects like these? Um, well, it's pretty similar to or the same as any other projects. It's, it's a standard uh, uh, stages. Um, the difference is that this went through an international competition and it was won by the designer. And after that, they spent a bit more time in developing that design, uh, the concept design, uh, until it was uh, uh, okayed by the, the, the client. Um, then uh, they went through a rigorous design development process. Um, our, our involvement started with uh, construction documentation. So they were in uh, late stage of design development, um, <clears throat> um, close to final, which is the uh, uh, documents that was passed on to us. Um, so during construction documentation, we still had to do uh, a bit of DD, uh, a lot, well, not a bit, a lot more DD during uh, during the process. Um, the tender stage, we were not too privy to it because the owner had its own team um, doing the evaluation for this one. Um, they asked us to consult on specific matters like uh, knowledge of uh, contractors, who's good, who do we know, and, and, and that kind of stuff. So, and then uh, during construction administration and supervision, we were very much involved. Uh, there were a lot of 
uh, meetings inside, uh, um, making sure that the design is built to the vision of the concept designers. So uh, who are the people involved in projects like this? In this case, um, of course, the client is Marina Bay Sands. Um, then the side, the, the external partner is the, the Singapore government. Thematic Holdings is a big um, uh, stakeholder in this endeavor. This is, uh, the Marina Bay Sands is an integrated resort. So it is not only a pretty building in a spot of the city, but it is meant to be an icon and uh, it's meant to bring in um, uh, economic, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, economic improvement, you know, um, uh, for Singapore uh, in terms of tourism. And there's also your casinos and you have retail and all that. So the designers are Safdi Architects, uh, Moshe Safdi. He's um, American Israeli architect. Uh, you, you should read up on him. He's, um, <clears throat> he's an interesting uh, architect and has built uh, many iconic buildings around the world. Of course, Peter Walker Partners, Landscape Architecture. They're known as PWP now. Peter Walker is uh, has been around for some time and and is one of, also of <clears throat> an icon in, in the industry uh, whom I followed and was happy to work with when, when we landed this project. So um, ADAS is the, uh, the architect of record. They're the, uh, uh, in Singapore, we call them the superintending officers. They were, they're the, uh, they're the ones who are legally, uh, uh, well, not liable, responsible for the development. So they manage the design, they manage the way it's built uh, in, in coordination with the vision of the, origin of the uh, designers. Breda in Asia, which I was part of at the time, uh, is the landscape architect of record. Uh, then you have Arup as the engineers, uh, for uh, all aspects, mechanical, sanitary, civil, structural. Uh, we worked with them in the structural sense also, a uh, very good team. And it had a, <coughs> the development had a lighting designer, project lighting design. So as the landscape architect of record, um, Caribbean, so we were to develop and produce construction documentation. Uh, this meant we had to uh, to put into um, technical drawings the, the design development that we get from PWP, and then uh, get them ready to um, for tender and then eventually construction. These are, are two types of documents that we we uh, did for them uh, for the project. We did uh, drawings and technical specifications. So, which is a very important part of the documentation. Um, of course, construction administration and supervision during the uh, uh, construction period. Our team was composed of the project director, my, my boss, Dennis Taylor. Of course, he owns the firm. And as team lead, uh, I did that for the office. Um, we had a document controller, uh, which I will explain later. And we had a technical team. I had a, anywhere from, I think from six to eight people. And the most I think we had, we were eight in the team, just doing the, the documentation for the project. Then, like I mentioned earlier, we had to have a specialist on board, uh, an arborist, horticulturist, and an irrigation specialist. So, as I mentioned, the Marina Bay Sands is an integrated resort development. Um, the budget is stated there, I mentioned it earlier. Um, you can say that this budget is for the whole development, but still, if you get anywhere from five to 10% of that overall budget, that is still in the hundreds of millions. So um, it is considerable. Um, the trees alone, I remember cost, around for the whole development uh, about 
five million dollars for all the trees because we had a project nursery also. So that's the kind of uh, cost that uh, we had here. Of course, you, you have to put into play the finishes and all that. Um, it has uh, 12,000 square meters of landscape, the whole development. And 75% of that are mostly public spaces. And uh, it's almost all on structure. It's a podium, right? So there is a very few spots in the development that is on true ground. Most of it are uh, on structure. So all the trees, um, especially in the promenade along the streets here portion are all on structure. <clears throat> you have uh, 800 meters of waterfront. Uh, half of it, uh, the one below are all in timber. Um, hence the specialist in timber construction. Uh, you have a 5,000 square meter event area in the middle. This is uh, an amphitheater that can configure itself uh, automatically from amphitheater to flat deck in a matter of uh, minutes, right? And then you have a, a thousand meter long uh, landscape bridge. And you have, of course, a 10,000 square meter sky park at the 57th story. So what, what, what's the complexity in doing a project like this, right? So um, it has many moving parts. Like I mentioned before, um, these are split into different parcels. So our team or my team <clears throat> at that time was dealing with different parts of the project at any one, any one week, right? So for example, the hotel we will have one architect from the architectural team, uh, an engineer for that. So I had to join them to discuss uh, our part uh, where we're involved in the hotel. And then another, another team is in charge of the sky park, which is another part of it. Um, we have another team who is in charge of the promenade. Um, so uh, you you have to be able to um, I don't know learn how to manage uh, the time um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, your document production, in terms of the coordination with uh, the design team, right? So and coming to that. We had to um, coordinate uh, the project in different time zones, right? Because um, uh, some some uh, uh, a number of consultants are based uh, abroad, you know, in the U.S., in the U.K., or in Australia, um, <clears throat> and uh, I think this is this is 2005, and we were already doing. Uh, uh, Zoom meetings, sort of Zoom meetings. We used, uh, I can't remember what we used exactly, but uh, we used a similar concept of um, of coordination at the time. Um, uh, there were times uh, we were in the office at 6.30 a.m., 6, 6.30 a.m. because the meeting would start at 7, because the time zone is like that. Um, so that was, uh, that was for, three or four years of the project, right? And then uh, we had a document controller specifically in the team. All he does is uh, make sure that the documents are in order and ready to load. Um, the cloud was not yet there at the time, but uh, our <clears throat> all documents for the project are handled uh, through one source. All consultants or contractor will submit their documents uh, online through this. Uh, we call it Aconex. And um, so you had to have proper uh, documentation control numbers, which our document controller made sure of. Uh, if not, it will come back to the team and you know rework before we can even upload it to, to, the, to the system. Um, we could not. For this project, we could not hand over uh, what do you call it? hard copies, just like any other project, right? So if somebody requests, we could not hand it over, uh, you know, over the over the counter. We have to go through the system, and just the same when we request drawings uh, or, or documents, it has to go through the system. So, and and our document control manager has to sign sign that off. 
right? Um, quality control, I had to work, we had to work closely with uh, Peter Walker's team. You know, they would redline our drawings. That was already redlined by our team. So there are <clears throat> checks and counter checks for, the, uh, for our documentation. Now we had to write very, very stringent uh, technical specifications in, you know, uh, for, for uh, various parts of the project. Um, like for instance, paving units, um, what type of stone, how thick, uh, water absorption and all that, and how it's going to be built. Uh, that's all written in, in a very thick document <coughs> that, um, that uh, specifies for all uh, aspects that we use, you know, from, from drainage cells to the soil that we use, um, especially for the sky park, which uh, needed uh, soil to be a certain weight, for instance, right? And plant specification was not was not necessarily difficult. We we <clears throat> um, the the initial uh, design for of uh, of uh, PWP was spot on, except for uh, we had to check through our arborist and um, uh, the supply whether it's it's there or whether we can get a certain number. So these, these, if we do not find it, we have to replace it in the specification and change it. So the project had a, um, a project nursery of its own. Uh, most of the trees were pre-grown. They were um, they were purchased uh, like a year or two before um, before final planting. We had an off-site nursery that held. At any one time, about a thousand to three thousand trees. You know? So for different parts of the development, and uh, even some of the shrubs, uh, when it uh, about three to six months before they were planted, some of them were uh, sampled at the nursery to check whether they they grow a certain way or whether it will work in certain conditions. So we had those. Um, and then uh, material specification. You know, choosing hardscape materials. Uh, it started in our office from our library, and then uh, when when the designers had chosen, <clears throat> we had to check the source um, and uh, whether they can cut it specifically to the sizes that, that the project uh, uh, needed. So we had we we went back and forth to China and find the find a source. Uh, the same with the trees, uh, the plant material. Uh, we had to go back and forth over a period of time to nurseries in Malaysia um, and Thailand just to find the right size. Um, if you can see the picture below, these <clears throat> PWP and our team actually handpicking most of the trees in the development. So this is the promenade. Um, I can still remember there are 222 Roystoneas along that promenade from end to end, right? So all of these were uh, handpicked well, <clears throat> to be planted. They, they had to have the same height, same thickness and all that. So, um, and uh, like I mentioned, this is all on the podium. Underneath that row of trees um, is a uh, utility. Uh, utility lines from drainage to phone lines to electric lines to water lines that, that serves this part of the development. So we had to work with the engineer closely and they continuously asking us whether, can you work with this depth? Can you work with this width? Um, of course, we would say, no, can you do this for us? And they would, they would of course, uh, respond. Um, but uh, there were very few. Um, we're happy to say that during this time, um, because we had a pre-grown nursery, um, we had a uh, very you know, few case of uh, uh, depth in, in the trees that we chose for the development. Um, again, like I said, the uh, uh, half of the promenade that is close to the water is all wood, it's all timber. It's yellow balao, 
again, the sourcing for the trees, uh, for the uh, for the particular wood was uh, an exercise. And um, uh, the way it was built, we had to work closely with a timber construction specialist because of the scale and, and the way it, uh, the designers uh, envisioned how the, the slats will be laid. Uh, they had a specific um, design for it, especially in curves. They had to <coughs> uh, uh, cut, uh, do special cuts for the wood that, uh, that to work with the curves. And for the stone uh, paving on the events plaza, uh, this came in from China that, uh, like a puzzle. Every crate had a specific area uh, where it would go, and the stones are numbered because we use three, uh, you know, uh, we use uh, three sizes of stone. Uh, so in order to for it to work, the only way for it to work uh, is to number the actual uh, each stone that will go that will be laid out into the events plaza. So that's one of the complications that we encounter there. Now, um, uh, the hotel. Uh, there are several aspects of landscape in the hotel. Uh, one of the most exciting for us was this uh, this facade where you have a balcony filled with bougainvilleas. Um, these are thousands of you know thousands of bougainvilleas. We and and the designer Peter Walker's uh, team had specific colors in mind. So, <clears throat> in order for us to uh, fulfill that vision. Um, Several types of bougainvilleas were, were tested in the project nursery, you know, in, in the medium uh, that we were going to put in the box. So we had to see uh, how they grow in a certain number of, uh, in a certain period of time. And, uh, you know, some fail, some grow more than others. Some are, are uh, lush, but, but uh, there's not enough quantity in the market. You know, that's kind of problem. And when it came time to plan one specific color was not could not be uh, acquired but since you're, they were on a timeline uh, you know it had to be planted and then yeah that created quite a steer but uh, was resolved eventually uh, the trees in the middle that you see are you know uh, ficus bengalensis these were acquired, uh, like I said, a year or two before. And then in the project nursery, we grew them under shade. So we had to, <clears throat> the nursery contractor had to uh, construct uh, netting above these trees. And then uh, they were also trained to grow a certain way. So our arborist had to, uh, it's like practicing bonsai, you know, he had, he had you had to tie branches, pull them one side or the other, so that the tree, when we planted it, is a certain shape. You know? So uh, for these trees, they're planted around the middle of the hotel. So so you see, uh, if you go to the, if you visit the hotel now, those that are planted outside, of course, are doing much, much better than the ones inside. And uh, but we had this incentive to make this work because they can, they are, uh, it's, it's almost impossible to replace the ones that are inside, right? So the, 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 the large pots that, that they were placed in could not be, uh, are very are fragile. They're ceramic pots. They're $50,000 a piece and are, has been, uh, uh, fabricated specifically for the hotel. So you cannot find it anywhere. So replacing that tree is uh, kind of <clears throat> taking care of the pot, making sure that it doesn't break. And, uh, you know, bringing in heavy equipment to lift the trees is just not possible. So it had, it had to work. So uh, during the time, a year or two after the development, uh, no tree had died. I, not sure now. The other complicated part here is this bridge. It spans the hotel going to the, uh, at the third or fourth story of the hotel. 
So you can cross from the middle of the hotel to Gardens by the Bay and and to the other side. I uh, I can't remember what's on the other side. So uh, this the design calls for uh, uh, columnar trees to be planted here. Um, in this case, these are caralias. On the other side, um, it was the polyaltia. The problem with the tree. Um, uh, because the buildings were coming up, you know, wind tunnels were forming, and the uh, polyalphias, when, when they were planted early, and we had to make a solution that they do not bend. So, you know, uh, they were there for some time with a steel pipe uh, supporting each tree. So, in this parcel, the uh, sky park, um, uh, I told you about the size earlier, and and it's uh, it's quite long, and about the <clears throat> it also has the longest swimming pool. Although in reality it's not a full pool, as you can see in the picture below, there separated by uh, the movement joints for the building, right? So our main uh, challenge here is that. We had to devise a way in coordination with uh, construction engineers to bring up the trees uh, to the 57th story without uh, without breaking any of them, right? So, so it was a close coordination between us, our arborist, the arborist of uh, the contractor, and the crane operator, and the engineers who would, you know, find a place where we could store the trees up there. Again, the onus for us to make this work is huge because once the cranes were gone, it's practically impossible to bring up a fully grown tree to replace anything that has died. So one of the solutions that was done there is uh, some of the trees are double in number. So there was a time we had to bring back down some trees because it, the garden was so packed, right? Uh, <clears throat> Because the, the idea was that if one tree died and you just take from one, one spot and replace it. Um, of course, we could not do it for all the trees, especially the ones along the pool, which uh, I think today is one of uh, uh, the problems. They could not be replaced with the, the tall ones, right? Um, another challenge here is the weight of the uh, gardens themselves. So we had to come up with a way to lighten the soil material and of course polystyrene to make uh, those uh, areas that are not needed to be deep um, and to be made shallow. So some of the challenges, we work closely with um, the architect, the structural engineer also to, to hide, uh, not hide, make it less uh, conspicuous. Uh, movement joints between the buildings, as you can see here, that are one to 1.5 meter wide. So a special, um, uh, uh, what do you call this? A special uh, movement joint was designed specifically for this hotel to, to <clears throat> not only for the food side, but for the garden. Um, so that was the case study for, for what happens in projects like this. Of course, this is just a snap, uh, a snapshot of what, what we went through in three or four years of developing this project. But um, I think uh, if you uh, are able to, to handle um, projects like this, the, the learning curve is, you know, um, of course, it's just, uh, there's no better place to learn. In projects like this, you will encounter some of the most you know, creative engineers, some of the most creative people in architecture, landscape architecture. And it, it, because of the money thrown at it, you know, because of the funding, it, the design just can go, uh, can, be, can be followed and can be uh, built to such a quality that you know, people are still talking about it today. Um, I will now go through the design process. Um, 
uh, case studies, uh, different projects of similar size. Um, these are projects I mentioned earlier. These are all large scale projects. Um, it's essentially me sharing some slides from my former office on how uh, the design was arrived at. Uh, and let me start off with with uh, Viva Baria. Uh, let me just. So. Again, um, what you see here are the built um, uh, projects. I think this was taken for, uh, yeah, this was taken, I just took this off the internet and it's for marketing uh, for the property. And you notice the swimming pools, different shape. And then the, the boardwalk below the beach. And then in the picture at the lower right, you notice the boardwalk. Um, in this next picture also, <clears throat> you can see the, the pools, the different shape, the boardwalk and the levels that were built in. Um, so this is how it started. Um, for this project, we were not in, as involved as uh, Marina Bay Sands in, in the construction part. So um, uh, what we did was develop our documents as guidelines, right? Like, like this, for example, this is a, a design guideline for, for the uh, owners to, to go on with uh, building the development without having to, <clears throat> with, only, with, with periodically consulting us on the design. So like any other projects, uh, we, we go through this exercise in design. Um, we describe the area, the different nodes, uh, how to circulate, then how you would access it or how it's related to the other parts of development. These are all the towers around it. And you have the boardwalk below. I'll show the towers later. Uh, <clears throat> you'll see how each nodes relate to a specific set of, uh, specific set of buildings of towers. Each each set of towers have their own, um, what do you call this? In marketing, they have their own names, right? Like, um, for example, you have, uh, what is this? Okay. This is just a note. Um, for example, I can't see the top. And, uh, yeah, for example, this is uh, for the set that's called Casablanca. So for each one, we designed a certain pattern of the node so you, people would know where they are, right? For different, uh, uh, for the different nodes, uh, these are the different patterns. <clears throat> and um, um, there are main nodes where you have kiosk uh, for refreshment or, or, or a restroom. Um, we show them uh, sections and elevations of it. We do such studies to show the relationship between uh, the beach and the, uh, the boardwalk and eventually the towers. So in this document, we also show uh, details of, of, uh, of uh, seat walls and low walls, um, tree grades, uh, how they work um, with the other parts of uh, other elements of the project, like bollards and lighting. Um, we choose the lighting uh, 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 type. And, um, of course, we <clears throat> we specify <clears throat> sorry we specify uh, the plants uh, that would go uh, along the boardwalk. Uh, and uh, you can see the rationale there why we we, we chose them. Um, and uh, uh, irrigation uh, uh, irrigation zones are also defined in this document, right? So that's for each plot. Now for the towers, sorry. All 
right for the towers um, again notice the swimming pools uh, along the podium as you can see here so this is how it started so we did studies for for each uh, uh, each tower set you had the rectilinear type and you have those that are curvilinear so uh, these were early days of SketchUp, and we used them a lot to do massing studies. When they came in, it was a big uh, boom for us because it made design a little easier. Right? So massing studies in plan. So we would uh, set the uh, character of the spaces, give the client an idea of, of what, uh, what we wanted to uh, look like. Uh, in this case, the concept forming uh, was not really that difficult because the architecture has already set it, and and the theme for the whole development is uh, you know basically follows uh, a Moorish uh, a modern Moorish architecture type. So we just had to follow through with it, and then uh, design the forms that would go through it. So we would show the clients um, uh, mapping studies like this, and then populate it. And see how they would react to it, you know, uh, different uh, views, um, streetscapes, how they would look. And again, massing studies of how the uh, towers, the podium, and the boardwalk will relate together with the beach, different views of it. So, in this form, uh, so Viva Bahia is a, uh, um, is under claimed land. You know, there is no, uh, the grading that you will do is, there's no actually there's no grading you you build up right like in this case but so it, but in during the design we said that uh, let's let's play with the form of the the podium so that it doesn't so, so from the boardwalk it doesn't come up like a straight wall so in in these terms land forming uh, is built up uh, is a built up structure and we tried to uh, create layers so that it doesn't come up as a very um, imposing structure. So we show them massings like this and then uh, populate it. So how it would look like, soften it up. So again, another scene. So of course this was ambitious and <clears throat> we, were, we were proposing, uh, you know, uh, infinity walls, waterfalls along the promenade. Of course, I think in some parts they did, but, but only in, in, in very few spots. Um, so again, the massing. So how the boardwalk relates to the um, to the towers, how you can get up to it, how you can access and create spaces within uh, the the different levels. So there you go. And then uh, at the end of the report, you know, it's practically descriptions of what. Um, what we want, what we envision for each part of the project. So um, next to that is the intercontinental, I'm oh, sorry, which you, um, this one. Let me just full screen that. So um, <clears throat> the intercontinental uh, which you is in China is uh, is a resort complex, hotel, spa, resort complex. It uh, you have hotels, you have villas, um, you have uh, I think there used to be nine, and then they built through their next phase, and now there's a full uh, eighteen hole golf course. In, in the in the project, right? So um, we worked with WATG in this project. So again, in this project, the concept forming on how the landscape would look like is uh, practically a given because uh, uh, from the onset, the the client and the architecture, <coughs> the architects have have set that you know in, in the structure. This is supposed to be a um, like a an old Chinese village, 
uh, although romanticized, if you like. So <clears throat> you can see the forms. Um, those roofs are made of concrete, by the way. So um, they just made it look soft. The whole, there are no uh, timber in that roof. Um, so this is the built. Um, uh, I'm showing you in reverse. I, I show you the uh, after <laughs> before. So this is a uh, different aspect of the project, you know, the spa, um, the swimming pool, and and you can see here their uh, signage on the lake. So it started off, uh, this is an advanced stage of the master plan where most of the, uh, uh, the design and the planning has been ironed out, right? So as I said, it used to be nine holes and now they have expanded it to uh, 18. So uh, we would do studies for each part of the project and then uh, create, you know, really, if you could, if you remember the, uh, the signage a while ago, that's the spot. So, so we had to research on, on, uh, on details of uh, a Chinese village little details, lamps, uh, uh, cornices, and parts of uh, architecture, and then interpret them in the landscape, uh, use them in. As you can see. So, of course, uh, because of the nature of the site, which uh, had a natural lake and the surrounding hills, so we had to be very, uh, sensitive to that and use that as well. Right? And <clears throat> materiality was uh, also um, something we had to be uh, careful of to sort of in keeping with the theme. Um, you know, so <clears throat> the swimming pool in relation to the lake. And we had of course, you won't find that. Uh, we had to put in uh, little uh, accents in the pool, like the fishes. Uh, so the <clears throat> the goal for the the whole project is to create a little bit of uh, you know mystery. It, it's all modernized or romanticized, but still there's a feeling of uh, classicism in in the design. When they go around, they, they encounter bits and pieces of old Chinese architecture. So we did, we do a lot of sections to uh, to see the relationship of uh, the, the landscape with the, with the architecture and the surrounding uh, scenery. This is the part of um, the development where it, it ties in with the lake, the same part. Uh, different uh, portion. So <clears throat> the hotel is facing a hill, and on that hill is also part of uh, the property. We were asked to um, locate a pagoda that would become like a focal point. And then, uh, of course, we did a lot of grading studies for this hill and how we can place the walkway and access that pagoda. Um, we designed the waterfall at the bottom, so it relates to the lake. Um, and then, uh, as you can see, this colorful spot. Uh, my colleague, uh, who who was more attuned to the planting in China, uh, did a palette where you will have uh, interior colors for uh, in different seasons, in in <clears throat> uh, in different seasons in in that region. So you have summer, winter, uh, summer fall, winter, spring, like that. So you can see this is the concept for that. Um, and the planting during uh, fall and supposed to be colorful during autumn. Now there's an island spa that you saw earlier. So we do a lot of uh, visualizations for, for the client. And this is another part, the day spa. This is more for, um, this is situated near the entrance. Uh, 
it's the we like to call it the less luxurious part before before the hotel. It's more for uh, uh, general public uh, access, but still, it was fun. So that is it for Ruicho. <clears throat> And uh, hang on, one of the last, sorry. So another case study here is the uh, Shangri-La in the Maldives, Vilingili, right? So these are uh, the existing photos, the after construction and functioning after a few years, right? So as you can see, uh, again, we worked with WATG for, uh, in this project. Um, so the, the, the uh, concept for this resort is a village, island village, right? So we developed, the, the whole island was being developed and the different uh, uh, villas were situated around the island you will see later. And again, the theme was set by the, the natural setting and the uh, architecture that was decided upon, right? So it's like a <clears throat> modern uh, vernacular architecture. So for this, um, of course, we did uh, studies, you know, existing flora and fauna, uh, uh, the level of tides that come in, you know, um, different parts of the year, parts of this island disappear. So we had to be careful in how we design the walkways that connect the different villas of the island, or uh, the atoll. It's an atoll. Um, and uh, before we began uh, the, the concept design, the client actually uh, passed to us a, a volume on on an environmental study for the island. Now what's there, what uh, can and cannot be done. And like I said, this, the tide studies. Um, so that was part of the homework before we started the design. So master planning, we, we worked this out together with the, uh, with the architect. So locations of, uh, of um, uh, villas, the hotel, the, uh, uh, the, the, the utility buildings where it would go you know, in, in relation to the existing uh, features of the island. So these are the circulation paths studies you know, where were the important parts of the, uh, or nodes. Neil? Island. Yep. Neil, excuse me. I think your, sure. slide are, your slides are not moving. No? Yeah. Okay, where are you now? Where are you now? Ano lang eh, yung pictures lang nung ano, pictures lang nung resort. Ano so yung, yung mga, yeah, yung circular circulation studies mo, parang hindi namin nakikita. Okay, so okay. wait lang, okay. Sorry ah. Yeah. yeah, is it coming up? Mm, not yet, still wala the siya. Still the same. Oh, still the same. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, balikan ko yan. Yeah, okay. Ayun. I'll, I'll do a, a nakita mo. Uh, how about this one? Can you see it in this form? Yes. Ayan, you can see all. Oh, so, maybe I'll just do it like this. Ah, uh, yeah. Just slide it, right? Yeah, uh, it's okay. It's better? Right, okay. Yes. So, actually, yung Shangri-La kanina, eh, yung Intercon kanina, ganun din, isang slide lang eh. So I was wondering, oh, oh. pero okay, we'll just go to the Shangri-La Resort na lang siguro. Uh, we can we can slide through it later. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Sa kasi okay. sayang, it's the process kasi, no? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah uh -huh. So uh, it's the same, uh, yeah, anyway, it's the same process here. So yeah, I was mentioning a while ago, we did studies just to go back, right? So there were studies on the existing uh, features of the island flora and fauna included uh, master planning with uh, circulation. And then uh, for each uh, 
uh, note, we did uh, several studies in, in uh, uh, coordination with the architect, how to form that village feel. So mood boards, uh, layouts, you know, and then uh, we had to detail the, the texture because we need to uh, convey that to the client. So in plan, a well detailed uh, plan, different parts. Again, section studies, uh, how the uh, <clears throat> different... Uh, Neil, ethics. excuse yeah. me. Uh, it's the same slide pa rin. Hindi siya pumunta oh. dun sa, ano, sa sections. Right. And, okay. Uh, um, yeah. Mabagal yung anon. Right. Okay. So maybe I'll do it a little slower. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. So yeah, it's there. It's there. Okay. Okay. Um, here you go. Section. Coming up. No, it didn't change. Okay. So. I-click mo kaya yung slide doon. Or try to exit and then share again. Okay. Let me do that. Ayan, ah, yeah, uh -oh. yeah. Sorry for that. It's okay. Baka ma-click pa yung leave. <laughs> <laughs> Don't click leave. <laughs> Uh, While uh, Architect Neil is uh, troubleshooting, uh, I encourage the participants to... There you go. There's the section. Wow. Okay. I encourage the participants to uh, start typing their questions already. And especially the third year, no? Because your next plate is on resorts, no? Uh, I think it's Ecolodge yata yung, yung, ano, yung plate nyo, next plate nyo. So... There you go. That's a nice okay. section. Right. Uh, okay, there are several uh, smaller plants nice. in different parts of the island, right? Okay. And uh, more sections, more section studies. So the sections are essential because it shows you, again, a relationship between different parts of the development in the beach, right? So is it showing okay now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay lang kahit na ganyan tayo. Oo. Okay Doesn't have para... to be full screen. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, um, as part of uh, the, the island there, Shangri-La always has in its, um, in its resort development, there is always a spa attached. Uh, they call it the cheese spa. Or, <clears throat> and uh, again, as part of the you know, concept forming, we had to prepare uh, mood boards. Um, of course, we had to look at uh, existing cheese paths like in Shangri-La Maktan and uh, other uh, uh, similar places. So, but uh, they actually have, um, what do you call this, a specific designers for that also. So we had to work with him as well. So these are some shots of island life uh, as we envisioned it. So we, the, the, the main idea is that um, the structures are not, not imposing uh, in the landscape, you know, it blends in like so. So here you go. So most of the uh, most of the villas have their own pools attached, as you saw in the picture, as you can see here, facing the sea. Um, the reason for that is that although you have the beach there, so if uh, I've never been to Maldives, but <clears throat> seen a lot of a lot of friends have been, um, they're not swimmable. They're actually very rocky, uh, depending on where you are. They're not like Boracay. So. Uh, uh, in order uh, <clears throat> for guests to, you know, enjoy the water, um, if you're not if you're not in the uh, what do you call this nicer side of the island, so each villa is provided with a um, with a small pool, as you can see. So different sides of the island. We also did um, actual studies, so 
So my colleague took uh, some pictures from the boat around the island and located it on plan. And we did a theoretical uh, elevation and how it would look, uh, how, would, how the <clears throat> structures would look uh, superimposed on the island itself, like so, right? So they're not as imposing. So the art, uh, <clears throat> you worked a lot with the architects, this one, so. There you go. So maybe I just go uh, quickly to the, uh, uh, go back to Huicho for a while. What do you think, Vic? Yes, uh, I would like to see how the, how Intercon was ano, from developed from start to finish, no? Because, uh, yeah, I was involved then, kahit pa paano doon sa project na yun. Dropsman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> CAD operator ako doon eh, CAD operator. Yeah. Well, um, May CAD na ba so, noon, Sir Vic? Meron naman, meron sobra na. naman kayo. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, what, what happened is that I was with Ceridian and, and in SGS Designs, we never really cut, cut off uh, our connection, right? So, Every time there's opportunity, especially uh, it would give experience to to the firm. Um, I would I would think the uh, Yahoo Messenger, right? So that was Yahoo Messenger. <laughs> so so I, I I proposed to my boss that uh, because this this was a fast moving uh, uh, project and uh, we had to finish documentation quickly and. Uh, at that time, China was booming and the office was doing China projects left and right. I had maybe one or two people helping with the, with production, but we were not going to make it. So I proposed to him that we do uh, an outsource. And SGS Design was the uh, go-to partner. <laughs> that was Vic. Yeah. yeah. And his team in Manila. Right. So, uh, like I said, so it started. Uh, let's start that again um, with the with the master plan. Uh, it shows you the different uh, aspect: the day spa, the hotel, and the Neil, villa. Yep. Neil, wala pa siya. Oh, wala pa. Ah. Uh -huh. I'll, I'll I'll stop share this and start with this. Like yeah. Really, really. Yeah. Medyo weird lang ano. Okay. Anyway. Uh, well, I have to fly to Singapore, no, to ano, to discuss the project. Uh, it was 2000, ano ba yun? 2002, 2003, mga ganon, ano? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. 2000, 2004, 4, 5. 2004, yeah. 2004, yeah. yeah. Oh, may kad na nun, Ma'am Sharon, kau naman. Yeah, we were all kad. <laughs> yeah. okay. And also, Friendster. May Friendster nun. Multiply. <laughs> Multiply.com. Right. Yeah. Anyway, okay. Uh, so yeah, yeah, we can see now. We can see now. Okay. Yeah. So actually, Yahoo Messenger, pa ang ano So yeah. we will we will be chatting. We will be coordinating with Yahoo Messenger, right? So sending uh, drawings back and forth. So okay. Um, so just like uh, Villain Gilly, we we highlighted uh, uh, called blow up plans of 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 important areas, how they would look. Yeah, is it showing? Vic? Yes, it's wonderful. Okay. I remember those perspectives. Right. Yeah. So we, we created a lot of these views uh, for for the client. So, like I said, we did studies of uh, many aspects of the Chinese village trinkets and tried to um, interpret them in the design. So, so in the in the uh, construction documentation, you know, details for this were. We're done. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so features. Uh, as I mentioned, we worked with the site so that it looks as natural as possible. Uh, materials. Um, we were careful to to make them look uh, as much of what we were going to use. Um, there you go. This is the entrance. Then uh, the swimming pool as it relates to the lake and uh, the promenade beside the lake. So there you go. 
I think the fishes were also drawn in in the in the draw uh, technical drawing. So yeah, we we detailed each and every sculpture, isa isa yeah. yan, no? Uh -huh. And we base our details on those perspectives. Yes. So let's see there. Uh, so uh, again, we looked into uh, parts of Chinese architecture and made the pavilions, you know, uh, look like them. Uh, again, uh, sections. Um, my boss at the time, at the time, is uh, Dennis Taylor. He was an old school landscape architect, American landscape architect, who was active in the practice since the late fifties, all throughout, right? And and they they did it all by hand. So they, <clears throat> when we were doing this in in. Um, in, in SketchUp and doing Photoshop, he just couldn't relate and, and was not really, uh, you know, uh, for it because he could not, he could not uh, participate. But when he saw these and how fast we did it, that's the reason we had so many views. See? Normally in a project like this, you would, you would choose because if you do this by hand, you know, you would have like uh, maybe five or 10 shots of the most important parts because one, they're difficult to do. Two, if you don't have a team within the office, they're expensive. But when you saw the potential of, uh, of the technology, oh, it didn't stop. Give me a view of this, give me a view of that. And you know, like, so that's the reason why we had like you know, so much of these, uh, visualization, which the client also enjoyed. But at the time, China was also into a lot of uh, hyper-realistic drawings. You know, they, they were requesting that for us, from us, which we, of course, refused. Um, again, this is the, the, uh, the hill in front of the hotel where we place in the pagoda, a waterfall, and planting that had changed, that would change color depending on the season. So um, just to show you how to, how the land was uh, shaped uh, based on the existing and then part of what we, <coughs> we proposed. So the waterfall steps to the pagoda, the lake. Same with the island. So, we did studies for that too. See, the sections are still good to show that um, a quick uh, a quick view of what the what you have in your uh, landscape, and then uh, how it relates to other parts. Um, you can do that with the perspectives, but in technical terms, it's still hard to. So we still do we do that a lot in those days. So a spa. And as I mentioned the day spa. There you go. So more for a general public. So again, when we did this in documentation, these are in different packages. You have the hotel, you had the day spa package, you know that, so that when the client uh, started to build, what we needed to do was uh, submit or, or, or give the contractor specific packets that they will be doing. So that was the resort, uh, intercontinental resort. Um, one of the last, I'll show you, let me know if it shows up. It's still the same slide. Uh, which one? Yung RF spa resort pa rin yung ano. Ah, okay, so I need to uh, talk to care, care the other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So nope. I'll go to that uh, Chongqing development. Um, uh, it's not a resort. 
but uh, the reason I'm going to show it is to, well, uh, Rick and I discussed land manipulation. To yeah. me, when you say land manipulation, it's more like grading, right? So, yes, but, more or less. But it, uh, that's a different topic altogether and, and could take uh, one whole webinar to show. Yeah. So, I, uh, actually, we have a separate webinar on, on yeah. uh, general land manipulation. But uh, I, I asked you the topic just to give uh, uh, what do you call that? A base study, and yeah. how uh, how uh, large development affects uh, uh, the topography of the existing right. land. Okay, so so um, uh, through this project, through this uh, no, the different projects, like I said, <clears throat> we did we did grading depending on uh, on what type of site. Um, for the Marina Bay Sands, for instance, it's an urban site. And you would think that not much grading happened there, but actually the grading for an area like the promenade, for example, was complicated. Um, why? Because of the nature of the finish, which is a large dimension stone granite. And uh, you need to create falls, right? So one specification of the designers is that we would like to see uh, uh, very few cuts in in the stone. So when you when you when you do grading with the tile, you have to cut diagonally, right, in order to create the fall. So we had to, you know, do a lot of grading exercise in order to avoid a lot of these uh, uh, diagonal cuts in the finishes. That was a tedious exercise. So going back to uh, this project. Um, this project is a residential project. It's in Chongqing. And if uh, you haven't been to Chongqing, I, I lived there for a month for a project. Uh, Chongqing is a very hilly uh, city. You know, everywhere you go, there's a... <clears throat> it's not cool like Baguio. Baguio. It's, it's actually quite warm, but there are a lot of uh, 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 elevation changes in, in that city. So in one part of the city, this, this residential uh, development was proposed. So just like any development, we start with, of course, the concept forming. So we, we saw in the, the topographic map that was sent us, the topographic survey, that we were gonna be dealing with a lot of slopes. So automatically we looked at images that, you know, uh, uh, present to the client of, on how we can uh, uh, manage that through design and, and, and still come up with uh, you know, usable spaces and developable spaces for their um, res um, residential development. Um, you know, circulation studies, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, pinpointing circulation and important parts of the, of the landscape. I think the most important part here is that we actually did a uh, topographic um, study in colored form mm -hmm. it's for us and also for easier understanding of the client. Actually, this 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 is actually a standard in 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 some uh, more uh, strict uh, projects, right? Uh, especially in very hilly developments like this. So from shallowest to the tallest, uh, right? We, we marked it in color. Um, and then we began actual grading from there. Uh, we did not show it in this uh, set anymore, but there were actually a lot of pencil practice, a lot of uh, tracing paper and workovers for plant uh, grading in order to create uh, spaces within the hilly environment. So again, we had to show the client sections and how we would do uh, practice cut and fill on the hill to create uh, flat spaces for the structures and some of the features. So, so these are some of the sections where you can, you can easily see cut and fill uh, exercises. 
and in succeeding areas, you will see how we formed it. So in this perspective, you can see how the terrain change uh, for the road on the side, how it goes down. Uh, we use that as uh, an opportunity to create water features, you know, coming out of the building and then going down into the land, crossing over to the other side. Um, and this part, uh, we created a like a stream coming down from the from the mountain. It's part of the feature. Um, this area is their commercial space, so it's a it's a small commercial space, but we created that view. Um, so you would look out into um, an interesting site. So more of that area. So th so there's excuse me. <clears throat> so there are spaces where uh, the grades became too tight and. Uh, but still, we had to create um, uh, uh, usable spaces um, within within that uh, grading. So we we did terraces. We did a lot of terraces. We proposed a lot of terraces. Um, in some cases, we had to uh, yeah retaining walls could not be uh, avoided. Create these spaces. So. This is an early part. This is, uh, I think, um, this is the early scheme that we showed them. And uh, unfortunately, the project did not progress from here, but we did a lot of studies on how to create spaces for them within the, within the context of their terrain. So, a lot of that. Um, specific areas of the site. So, so we created a small pocket part when you're coming down. Then uh, <clears throat> we, where there is opportunity, we created water features because of the natural terrain and at the bottom. So, oh, I think that was the last slide. Um, I think that's all I've got for today. Well, uh, th that's a lot, no, to take in for our students, no. Uh -huh. uh, those uh, the the projects are quite interesting in terms of scale, no. Uh, you you discuss yung well, like small scale hanggang sa large scale projects, and then then right. up to mega mega projects, no. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what do you call that? In, it's 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 a very interesting mix, actually, of projects that you handled. No, uh, I think, uh, Ma'am Sharon, are you still here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Right. You want to add, Ma'am Sharon, before we go to the question and answer? Wala yata siya. Anyway, uh, uh, mabagal yata net din niya eh. Anyway, uh, okay, we'll start with the question and answer muna, no? Sure. Okay, so AJ, uh, Professor Rossell, AJ Rossell will handle the question and answer. AJ, can you start? Hi, sir. So we have a few questions here. Start okay. With, can you expound more on the design competitions now? Why is it not implemented here? Uh, design competition. Um, I, I wouldn't know the reason why. So uh, here, in, in my context where I say design competition happens when, when there is uh, uh, like, like, like a high profile project that the <clears throat> the the public uh, sector is involved in Singapore the public sector is very strong right the government so for instance they want to highlight a space um, yeah, they're only building uh, one example is they're only they will be building a uh, public housing estate 
you know, but it's in the middle of a of the of the central business district. And the central business district is a you know is very important, and you cannot just build uh, 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 architecture that would uh, that would stand out. So they called the an international competition. They set they set the a brief on how high and what it would look like and all that. So a competition was called for that. So that's the process here. They they wanted to attract name designers too. So uh, eventually these projects become landmarks, right? Like like for instance the jewel, the Marina Bay Sands. There is a purpose for for calling that competition. Um, in the Philippines, I think there were some comp. I've heard of some competitions there, but it's really like uh, uh, I, I know the Senate building. There was a competition. Yes. Um, and uh, there was this icon in in BGC that there was also a competition, but you know, I supposed to be if if it it's that. Uh, spread out, uh, you'd hear of it. I, I, I heard about it through uh, sources. One, I was invited to join their team. Another, to to another sources. Not, I don't know how 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 wide how how they uh, uh, disseminate the information. Maybe there's more out there. Uh, yeah, know. may may I add on on design competitions in the Philippines? The problem is. Not not that many companies or firms are into multidisciplinary planning. Okay, mm. so what happens in the Philippines is that there's this particular firm that only does this, no, uh, right. LA work, RQ work, uh, structural works. There's not mm. much firm that uh, right. uh, that uh, gives you the whole services. Unlike in unlike abroad, uh, it's a one-stop shop uh, firm actually. No, or if they lack those uh, professionals, they are already in their what you call their portfolio. In the Philippines, so, wala wala masyadong ganon. Uh, well, well, here ganon din naman. It's the same, except that in in some competitions they would specify that you have to have a team. For example, you have you're the architect, you're the team leader. In this competition, we require that you have landscape architect, uh, engineers, because because of the nature of the project. So that's why in some cases we're re invited to, to participate, right? So I guess uh, it's also the, whoever's running that competition also needs to know that, you know, some projects or, or projects of a certain nature need a certain professional to be yeah. involved, not only okay. one. Yeah, and I think another issue would be the design build uh, nature of projects in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly um, project, uh, big projects or large projects, there's this particular particular budget, say a billion, and it's all in. And right. uh, some contractors or developers will, will bid on that certain amount and and after they won that bid, they will design it. So that's how uh, it works here in the Philippines, no? Mm. So it's it's kind of different in terms right. of bidding. Yeah, here okay. is uh, competition is used, or in other parts, it competition is used uh, because of the prestige of the project, and the profile, gardens by the bay. Uh, like Marina Bay Sands, Majuro, uh, Sentosa, they all went through competition. Because uh, may, yeah. may I ask, who shoulders the cost on the design competition? Is it the the participants or there's a subsidy? No, um, in some competitions uh, that I was familiar uh, uh, in sort of the part, you will be uh, only the the shortlisted ones will be uh, what do you call it? Uh, the new, uh, paid a certain amount. It's like a price for win. For example, uh, there are five shortlisted. Then you know you, you have a certain amount to defray the cost that you. And then if you win the competition, you have the project, and you, you also have uh, the winning prize. Uh, yeah. 
Mm. You also have uh, monetary. And, some of them, mm. like and the prestige of building that. Exactly. Designing that. Yeah. I mean, it, the guys who, who won for these projects here, of course, they're doing projects less and less. Now. Not only here, some other parts of the world. It's also, the, it's also the scale of the project. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. okay. So, AJ, any other question? Uh, it's also on about money. This question is 5 to 10 percent the standard LA cost abroad. How about in the Philippines? Uh, 5 to 10 percent is just uh, an estimate I use. Uh, not necessarily, but because of the scale of the project, you would think, right, that, that at least. Uh, this month, it could go uh, in some <clears throat> for projects like uh, 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 mega projects like Marina Bay Sands. It, 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 they they give a hefty amount. You know, this is not they cannot say that oh landscape is just an afterthought. It is part of the development. So there is funds there. The funds are are uh, the planning for the funds. Uh, Planning, uh, sorry, funds are part of the planning. It could be five, it could be ten. But if you if you look at how <clears throat> the finishes, the amount of wood we use, the amount of granite we use, uh, you know, uh, the amount of trees and plants, and the technical, uh, 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 what do you call this, uh, uh, logistics that needed to be done. Uh, in order to make it happen, then of course there's cost. In the Philippines, uh, I've encountered projects where uh, landscape is always at the far end, uh, and it's always uh, the first one to get top. It's the same here. There are projects like that that uh, it's changed over the years because here, like I, in one sem in one webinar where where I explained, Singapore has changed the notion. Of, of how it's it's growing as an uh, uh, as a city now the the onus is uh, a city in a garden so all projects whether it has uh, large landscape uh, components or not are are required to have a landscape architect and a certain budget for landscape and their developments are in such a way that the, the code here is that a certain portion of of the land is always uh, uh, you cannot stop. If you say 30%, that's 30%. And if the project brief says you have to replace 50 to 100% of greenery, of the overall, you know, when you found the land, you have to find a way to put it on the building. So there there must be a budget for it. So um, I hope that happens in, in Philippines. Um, yeah, it would uh. be good to see. Yeah, may I also add on the you know, on the uh, practice in, here in the Philippines on the uh, design build context of um, mega projects here in the Philippines. Although it's a design build, uh, they uh, some some of the projects that I uh, I was involved specifically states that there should be a landscape architect in this particular project and there there's also this particular amount that is set aside for professional fee for this particular particular profession so hindi yeah. siya talaga tuck in na design build na yung tipong kung ano na lang yung ibigay para sa design fee ng professionals hindi hindi siya ganon no but uh, these are government projects that we are talking about no so mm. kasi may procurement process on government so that what they do is they talk in the professionals within right. the contract no so yun yung nangyari kasi baka 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 magkaroon ng mixed message sa students natin na pwede pa lang mag-design build or something like that right. you know, for big and, projects and if i go back to the fee if there is a standard uh pala has a chart of uh it Peace. hasn't been changed for yeah there's a fee chart it hasn't been changed for decades but it's still uh usable uh, you just have to uh, plug in the current uh, context you know, uh, of how much money is now. So 
So you can use that depending on the project, there's a percentage, right? If you're doing a golf course, for instance, how big is it, uh, how big the budget is, then you have, you can charge a certain percentage. Uh, you can ask that from your professor. Yeah, uh, of practice. Anyway, AJ, I think uh, there are more questions, no? Dami. Yes, there's actually a lot of questions. Uh, <laughs> one of the professors are asking, for the benefit of our students, can you share with us the steps you take in conceptualizing a design from base plan to final design? Uh, Such as plan. the sketches and freehand drawings made and iterations involved. Oh, uh, well, uh, in, in concept, <clears throat> well, in, I, I don't know if I, but we, it, design always starts, um, it is uh, with a project brief, right? So <clears throat> from the project brief that the, the client will give you, for instance, here in the context in the context of resorts, um, so the island. Um, I, I want an island. I, I have an island. I want to develop a resort, and it has to carry this many uh, structures, etc. And the landscape needs to look a certain way. So we start from that, and from there, they give us. Uh, what the island looks like, of course, and plan technical drawings. We would do our 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 homework, you know. Like I said, in 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 uh, in when I was presenting Villingili, we would do a study of the island. Uh, in that case, we were also given a, a a volume on on what's there in terms of. Um, uh, vegetation and animal life and uh, uh, information on, on tides and where we can build. So it starts from there, all that information before we even start to look at the, uh, uh, before we even start doodling on the plan. Right? Um, <clears throat> then we look at the topography. Uh, so we work, uh, in this case, a resort will have structures. And by the time we start to design, there are already structures designed by, in, uh, by the architects. They have an idea, right? So we would start planning. That's when we start to do them. Now in the topographic map, uh, based on the other information that you receive, um, you would know where to place certain things. Like for instance, oh, this is the flattest part of the island. So we bubble in, you know, we do bubble sketches first, bubble planning, where, um, where uh, we would like to place uh, uh, your, your, your amenities you know, in, in, in the context of the existing site. After the different diagrams, we would study forms. So from that diagram, you, you lay over, um, you start to, to study the forms, okay, um, whether it's, depending on the design, whether it's, you know, you start doodling your curvilinear or rectilinear forms there and how it will fit into the island. So <clears throat> that will take many, uh, many versions. You, know, you would waste, in, in my time when I was still using tracing paper, um, I would like use a lot of it because you know, you would you would you would not get it in one go, right? First the form. Um, until you're satisfied with the form, you just keep on sketching. Once you're satisfied with the form, your second phase is like, uh, if you haven't done it already, you're fitting it into the topography, right? So <clears throat> the topography and the structures around it. So if you haven't done that during your first uh, doodling session then now you, 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 you need to refine that, you know, can it work? I'm doing, I'm doing my, for, in, for example, my pool here, but there's a very big drop. That would mean I would have to build, um, uh, I would have to build retaining walls and do cotton fields. 
and I don't want to do that. I'll be disturbing the land. So you adjust, you sketch some more until such time that you come up to the point where where you can do um, actual visual studies already, right? You know, sections, um, uh, perspectives. And still, this is still, uh, uh, you know, very conceptual. And you haven't, uh, and it, after this, you're just doing forms in doodle form, right? In doodle, uh, although you have the, the shape, if you haven't started with your concept on how that shape would look like with your finishes, with your other features, then you've got to study it some more, right? So um, to get to the part where I was showing you earlier um, in perspective and all that, there's a, there, you, you would have wasted a lot of paper and ink, uh, markers and, <laughs> and uh, uh, black point pens for us before and tracing uh, that the yellow butter paper. So once you've gotten, once you've gotten to the stage that the design is ironed out in a way, then you start, you start building it. Um, the, the design for us uh, from the doodle stage, um, it takes longer, uh, the, the length of time you do design will depend on the, the amount of experience you've had uh, in doing doing this thing. So um, after that, it's uh, it gets easier once you have the design in mind. It's just uh, refining it in, in in three dimension, building it in three dimension, getting it ready to present to the client. So I I, I guess that's a, that's that's a process that. Um, uh, we did, or I do, even to this day. So, uh, um, okay. yeah. Um, now, um, now, oh, sorry, sir. Yeah. Now, the because of technology, right? We sometimes we go straight into the model, working um, because you have uh, you have SketchUp, you have a, a basic sketch. You know, we, 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 we work in three dimension. It, it can be slower because, you know, it's clunky. It's not as fast as a sketch. But once you've had it, as you can see, you can create, uh, you can study your design from how many views you want. So you know, that's a changing process that we have here also. So yeah. Okay. On a related note, the students are asking, do you have any tips for them who will be working on large scale projects for the first time? And based on your experience, what specific large scale development project has been the most challenging to design for you, such as based on terrain, complexity, or other factors? Right. So as a landscape architect, when you begin, you know, you're, you're, I've been a part of large scale development in various aspects of, in various stages of the career, right? You're, you're the guy who uses the eraser, but you're doing large scale development, right? They pass you this, this plan and okay, you erase this part because it's gonna be revised. I started there and after that, okay, the part you erase, you draft this pencil and ink. You know. After that, uh, in, in maybe uh, another project, you gain more experience. Oh, can you design this small portion? You know, uh, maybe a small pattern for an entrance. Okay, then you're happy you you made a mark in this in these uh, developments. Um, to get <clears throat> to get to the part where I was. Uh, given the responsibility to lead a team to do uh, to do a, one of the mega projects, that took like twenty years, right? So um, you can join in when you when you're given the opportunity to to work in projects like this. Doesn't matter what part of career uh, your career you're in, 
whether you're an apprentice or already a project coordinator or a junior designer, just jump CAD in. operator. CAD operator, true, <laughs> right? Because it becomes, you, you see it, you, event, you, you see it, you begin to see uh, projects differently after, right? So there's no, uh, uh, well, the, the, the advice is to just jump in. So uh, when when I was first uh, when when I first uh, joined that that team in Marina Bay Sands, I was not the team lead. It was I had another superior superintendent, <clears throat> another director above me, and I was his lieutenant. I was his second. And it so happened that he got another offer from the other uh, integrated resort that was coming up. At the time, the uh, the uh, the Sentosa Resort, uh, Resort World, it was also coming at the same time as the Marina Bay Sands. So that I got a hot potato all of a sudden. So my my boss Dennis Taylor told me, "You're you're the man now. You're the guy." And I said, uh, "I can't do that. <laughs> I haven't done anything like that." So, but. Here you go, you're gonna do it. You're doing it. So I, I had no choice. So it was rough in the first few months because who has it's it's a once in a lifetime in your career, unless you're working for a very big firm who does a lot of these things, then just jump in, take it. And then if you're good, you'll just you know go through it. If you're a slow learner, then just learn and just do it. It can be rough in the beginning. After a while, you'll just, you'll just be happy for the experience. All right. Um, ending the Q&A with this timely question, what specializations would you suggest to young landscape architects to get into in the post-COVID world? Well, as a landscape architect, you're already a very specialized individual. Um, COVID is temporary. It will go, so it shouldn't affect, uh, you know, what you, you, you focus on your career. I chose to focus on design. I'm a, I'm a design practitioner. There are many aspects of the job. You can be in research, you can be in academe, you can be a, a project manager, you can specialize in, uh, in plants, not as a horticulturist, but, uh, but uh, a landscape architect is more attuned to the use of uh, plants. You can do that. Um, then, or like me, you can, you can choose to focus on design, you know, uh, in the built environment. Uh, I, I cannot. I cannot say uh, what what you want to focus on depends on on you on, on on your on what you like to do. If you like design, then go there. If you like to build with your hands, you can you can be a landscape architect and a contractor too. As a contractor, if you like to do <clears throat> builds. You like to be in the site more, you can be a site coordinator, as a landscape site coordinator. So these are uh, career paths you can look at. Um, you can just, what you can do is look at, at opportunities out there. You know, what type of firms you want to join. So, so yeah. Okay, so, uh... I think medyo mahaba na tayo no lumagpas na tayo sa time limit no so and, yeah uh, we enjoyed much no having you oh, dito on thank you yeah i think we I, made you sleep. <laughs> I think we need a part 2 for you yes, part two. <laughs> uh, kasi parang bitin pa eh bitin pa uh, okay. anyway uh, thank you very much Neil ma'am Sharon will be closing the webinar okay yes. so thank you also. Yeah. yeah, thank, thank you, you so very much, much Dre. Okay, Ma'am okay. Sharon.
In conclusion, we would like to thank you in behalf of the faculty members and students of the Environmental Design Studio Laboratory. Thank you very much, Sir Neil, for sharing your valuable time and remarkable expertise with us this morning. We had a wonderful glimpse of the design journey of different remarkable large-scale development projects locally and internationally, which is very helpful for our students. You have shown the substantive project stages from the project brief, coordination stage to the client and even to different um, allied professionals and even the importance of the site analysis conceptual to design development and implementation process. So somehow you were able to cover the evolution of the design project. And then thank you for also stressing the importance of the design considerations in terms of the location of the project, the materials, the importance of that, um, not only knowing the material students, but also knowing where to find it and to source out even the quantity and then the maintenance of it. And then you were able to point out the elements, the details, and even utilities. Thank you for the site analysis. We're in showing the importance of circulation, topo map, and slope analysis. And then for sharing the challenges that you have encountered, let's say like in the environment, in the Shangri-La Maldives, the tide, and even the provision of a pool because the water there is different as you mentioned in our Naghang yata si Ma'am Sharon. Hmm. Yeah. Ma'am Sharon, naghang ka. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, wala siya. Well, that's the reality okay. here in the Philippines, no? So medyo ano, medyo challenging talaga itong mga ganito ngayon sa Philippines. Oh. Anyway, okay, so again, uh, we would like to thank you, Sir Neil, Landscape Architect Neil Samak. And also, we would like to acknowledge the presence of uh, Landscape Architect uh, Kate Laxina, who, who is a uh, partner of Land Design One also. Okay, uh, Ma'am Kate, pakita ka naman. And we would like to ask, our students to turn on their video camer cameras. Ma'am Sharon, hi, naputol ka, nag-take over na ako. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. That was a good one. Uh, okay, let's let's uh, let's take a group photo before we end this uh, webinar. Okay, yung mga bagong gising, magsuklay-suklay. <laughs> 